Rejoice, rejoice, O Christian, lift up your voice and sing. Eternal hallelujahs to Jesus Christ the King, the hope of all who seek Him, the help of all who find. None other is so loving, so good and kind. He lives, he lives, he lives Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, he lives, he lives foundation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Amen. Thank you. Thanks, Mina. Well, it seems like it's been a long time <clears throat> since we've done this, but it hadn't been all that long. We, um, get my sounds off so I don't have another knock, knock, knock like we did this morning. Last week, from home, we finished Samuel. Did everybody get to see that, or, or were you part of it? The uh, closing out of Samuel, that was... Uh, Pretty interesting. Uh, we've really enjoyed going through the books of First and Second Samuel, and tonight, naturally, we would be starting First Kings, but I don't think we're going to do that. Were you all ready to? It's uh, well, that's where it would naturally wind up. But uh, tonight, we're gonna we're gonna share some different things, some things that are on my heart that I think will benefit a lot of the people that are that are uh, responding and uh, people whose lives are being touched by the Lord and for all of us, just some things that will be beneficial for us. But what I think we're going to pick back up on next week. Now, since we've been in Samuel, as I mentioned, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, and First and Second Chronicles are similar to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in that they're a different view of the same information. Uh, first and second kings are fascinating because you'll literally go through and not just the life of David again and Saul, but you'll see all of the kings as they transpired through Israel. Um, and that's a very good thing, and it's interesting. I didn't get myself girded up. If it comes across as though we weren't completely prepared tonight, there's a good reason we weren't. But don't worry about that. Uh, and First and Second Chronicles is a lot the same thing. And you'll see a lot of the same things that you've read in one and another with a lot more detail and different. Like uh, the stories uh, that David went through, they'll be, they'll be chronicled differently and in different detail in the other books. But rather than going to that where there would be some redundancy, what I'd really like to do is we started, I guess it was back in January of 2020, we started in Genesis. And... Uh, I'd like to really promote it for the online audience and, and whoever will come. I hope you guys will come. But I'd like to go through Genesis again. Uh, it's, it's not, it's, so many people when they think Genesis, okay, they think the beginning and the creation. Well, that's there, but there's so much more. Uh, what I really want to, uh, as children of God, if you're a believer, there are things that we need to know. We just need to know about us and our people, the people of God, <laughs> as you learn how God moves in people's lives. In particular, when God first called Abraham and Lot, Father Abraham, that's uh, in the culture today, as we look at what all is going on in Israel and such as that, that has everything to do with my family. That's my people. I am a Jew on the inside. That's what Paul said. Why am I a Jew? Because I've had circumcision of the flesh taken away. There are a whole lot of people that have the actual blood flowing through their veins of Father Abraham, who the Bible teaches they're not Jews at all. They're Jews in name only. That's not what's interesting to God. We need to know who our people are. There was Abraham and his son Isaac and then his grandson Jacob. And then we go, that's all in Genesis. Genesis covers so much space. And then when you come to Joseph, 
And the story of Joseph and the 12 brothers, I'm telling you, this, was, this takes me back to, uh, in, I guess it was January and February. of the, well, Y'all were here for a lot of it, weren't you? Yeah, me and George were. And uh, I never get tired of it, and I don't think you will either. As much fun as we had going through First and Second Samuel and reading all of these stories, what I'm eager to see, I tell you all this, and I'm not, just, I'm not just saying it, it's true. Some of the things that we find that, that get so entertaining and so exciting as we've been reading through First and Second Samuel and things that I point out in the stories, I didn't plan that. We're seeing things, and God's opening our eyes as we read it together. And I'm excited to go through Genesis again because I want to see what God's going to show us this time. And it's good. So uh, trust me, if you will. It's the Word of God any way you look at it. Let's go back and jump into Genesis again next Sunday night. And uh, I think that everybody will enjoy it very much. And I'm sure that we'll come away a little bit closer to God, knowing a little bit more about Him and His people. Mm. Tonight... Let's have another quick word of prayer. I want to share some things on faith, on walking by faith. There is nothing more important in our lives as believers than learning how to appropriate what the Word of God says is already true in our lives. It's the only thing that makes us free from the things that hold us. It's the only thing that makes us realize that we are living children of the Almighty God. We've got to start seeing with different eyes, and it's the eyes of faith. And that's what we want to look at at some various scriptures in here tonight. Father, Lord, as we open up your book, and as we seek you, we want to know, we hunger to know the truth, We hunger and thirst for Jesus. He is the truth, the way, the truth, and the life. And Lord, this is a mystery. And we don't want to take for granted that you've saved us, we're born again, we're going to heaven, and then go right back into our life of dealing with issues and feeling insecure and and incomplete. When the gospel of Jesus Christ and what was accomplished on the cross is the power of God to save us now, not just from hell, but now. Open our eyes, Lord, as we read through some of these familiar passages and help us to hear them in our heart and appropriate them to our life. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. As Sally mentioned this morning, our beloved sister Karen still couldn't be with us. She's going through some trials, difficult time right now in her life, in her healing, and uh, she's having uh, this morning and I guess last night sick at her stomach and not feeling well on top of her foot, seems to have possibly an infection in it where she's had her surgeries. She's having a difficult time. They've had three leaks repaired at their house, and there appears to be another one. So it's a difficult time. So please hold her up. And Karen, I believe that you'll be listening tonight. This is for you. And it's for us. We're going to take communion. We'll probably close the cameras off at the end of the service. And we'll share the Lord's Supper together. Um, She's fighting. She's in the midst of a battle, as most of us have been this week. One kind or another. We've all been through some battles. And these things hammer you. And you've got to understand something. It's kind of what I was pointing out this morning. We're soldiers in an army. And you've got to understand, Marina, as you start off on this walk, generally, generally speaking, when somebody comes to the Lord and gives their life to Him and comes new in salvation, there's a honeymoon. Sometimes it's a week, sometimes it's two weeks where it's just like, God is just so good, everything's so wonderful. I'm just, why didn't I do this a million years ago? And then the battle starts. And you've got to know that. And you use this honeymoon to hear and to, to learn and to determine, I'm in this for the long haul. I'm resolved. And you've got to understand what the, the, the characters in the Bible, when they came to Christ, it's not an attractive life to the flesh. Most people can tell you that. Because when you start to follow Christ, a big red target is put on your back. And every devil in hell, all they want to do is get you content to just say, yes, I got saved and I've been baptized, that's covered. Now get off my back and leave me alone, everybody. I still know what I want to do. I've got my focus in life. That's all the devil wants. If he can get you to that point, 
He'll back off and you can go on about your business. And you'll wind up being another cold, stagnant believer who's still going through depression and anxiety and fears and worries. And all of that stuff is real and it never stops. It'll get harder on the person who's given their life to Christ because the devil wants to destroy you. But as I always say, and all you children of God who are listening, hear this. We were not called into this to be defensive players. It's not about trying to cover your behind and survive a day. You do that at the beginning, and that's safest right here in this room. The wolf doesn't go into the middle of the flock and try to get him a sheep and kill him. He waits till one wanders out of the, out of the flock. Well, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. I say, yes, you do. Maybe not to be saved, but if you want to survive and you want to thrive and you want to become a formidable enemy against the forces of darkness, you need to be in your platoon. You need the strength of numbers. That's why we are a church. We're the church of Jesus Christ. Paul described us as a body. Now, I know Eddie back there, he used to be pretty rough and rowdy in his days fighting and scrapping. He could have the toughest fist in town. But if you take that fist off of his arm, what good is it going to do? If he gets in a fight with somebody and there's just a fist laying there on the floor, it ain't going to scare anybody. It's not going to do any good. Same thing. That's what Paul tried to get into our heads. You're a, you're a formidable piece of a very uh, intricate, working, perfectly functioning machine, the body of Christ. But if you disjoint yourself from that body, you are basically useless. And the devil has worked so hard through COVID-19 and now through the polar vortex, anything to break us up from getting together. I believe so many of the churches, like I've said, some of them aren't threats anyway. And that's sad. But God's calling up a church to wake them all up. And it's happening right now. As you see all of these things coming down on the world, God's doing something. And I don't know that the trumpet's about to blow, that Jesus is about to come back. He sure could. It may be another thousand years. We don't know. But something's happening. And we can see it. Many of the believers can feel it in their spirit. What's got to happen, I believe that God is separating the men from the boys, so to speak. And we've got to determine, I want to be in this. I want to be a part. I want to be used of... As I said in my prayer earlier and, and what I focus on, think about, again, in the gospel of Jesus Christ, think of what he suffered. Think of what he went through, the torment and the agony in Gethsemane when he prayed for his disciples and us, all the, in John 17 where it says, all those who would believe what they taught. He prayed for them and us. And he sweat, as it were, drops of blood. He was so antagonized. And he was praying. And then he was tortured. Why? So we could just be a Christian and I've got that part covered in my life now? No, 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 no. He went through extreme warfare in his spirit and his body was torn apart, the veil, for us to be superior like him, to be saved and made in the spirit and not, to, to, I'm telling you, you hear what I'm saying and you put your faith in this and anyone who's put their faith in Christ, you who've rededicated your hearts and you're, you're wanting to be in this full, full force, you go through three or four weeks of doing exactly what I'm saying, seeking God, focusing on faith, declaring when you get up in the morning, I am a child of Almighty God. I don't intend to sin at all today. Lord, I, I know I'm in this sinful flesh and I may trip. I may mess up. But I know you'll show me and you'll pick me up and put. Don't you dare say, I know I'm just a sinner, but God's got me covered and he's going to cover my, my sins. That's not how you live. If you got caught cheating on your spouse and they, and they forgave you, what kind of spouse would you be if you said, I know I'm probably going to do it again, but I've got a good spouse that will forgive me. Out. <laughs> We've been forgiven. So you look in the mirror and you say, I've been, I've been redeemed. I've been saved. I'm 1 John 3, 2. I am now a son. I'm now a daughter of God. Doesn't yet appear what I'm going to be, but I know when Christ appears, I'm going to be just like him. And you start your day that way, and you've got to start walking by faith. Mark this one down. 
We say it all the time, and I'm going to give you a lot of verses tonight that we've talked about over and over and over, but I'm hoping you'll learn them. 2 Corinthians 5.21. 2 Corinthians 5.21 is where Paul said that God made him who knew no sin. Jesus never sinned. He was tempted in all ways as we are. He, anything you've ever been right down on your knees just, just battling, trying not to do it, and you couldn't stand it. He was tempted in that in some way or another, some form or another, whether it was drugs, whether it was sex, whether it was alcohol, whether it was lying, whether it's stealing. He had a temptation, flood his body, flood his mind just like us, but every single time he said no. And God made him who knew no sin, not to just take on sin, but be sin, the Bible says. God made him who knew no sin to be sin so that you would be righteous. The righteousness of God. The devil says, no way. There's nothing righteous about you. Look what you just thought. He will never stop doing that. Revelation 12. He gets his. Verse 10, it says, I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ for the accuser of the brethren is cast down, which accused them before God day and night. That means day and night. Day and night, the devil and his minions are standing before God saying, look at Aaron. Look at Aaron. And, and you hear that. You hear that in your mind. And you hear it in your spirit. I know, oh, I fell short. I fall short. And the devil's constantly saying that. And it's resounding in our own flesh. But you've got to go back to 2 Corinthians that says you are now the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That's why he suffered. He didn't just punch a time card so you could punch a time card and be saved. He went through absolute torment and had the Father turn his back on him so you could be, here's the word, born again. Just like you were born in that physical body, and there's no doubt, there's a body sitting there. You know you were born the same way you've been born in the Spirit. Now, you've got to stop looking at this thing and start looking at what he put in you. And those of you who've been saved for years and years, it's no different. Golly, how long, 30 or 40 years, I walked my life still completely focused on this and the life about me, knowing that I was a Christian. I took care of that a long time ago. And there's a dwarfed, immature spirit of God living in me. The only thing it can do is when somebody says, well, I don't know if you're even saved. Then it rises up and says, yes, I'm saved. Yes, I'm saved. I know I'm saved. The Bible says. And there's no fruit in my life. And you can't even be sure if you're trusting that voice yourself. But when we begin to practice what we're telling you right now of saying, the Bible says I'm now made righteous. The Bible says that he who is born of God does not sin. And then I realize this flesh is incapable of not sinning. But in Galatians 5.25, it says, Galatians 5.25 says, now that you live in the Spirit, Walk in it. Walk in the Spirit. Turn to Galatians. Well, and that, before we leave that revelation, the accused, he accused them before God day and night. Verse 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives even unto death. Now that testimony, let me tell you something about that, George. That testimony is, is it, sure, we know that it's good when you're at work and the devil's been lying to you or whatever. You pull somebody aside and they say something's going wrong and you say, that did me too, but let me tell you what the Lord did for me. That's your testimony. That's the power in it. That's one of them. But I just got this while I'm talking to you, the Spirit's saying. That's not the only way. Sometimes you know what the word of your testimony is? When you're all by yourself on that tractor and the devil's lying to you and you're, you're feeling so insecure and things are... You're hearing the devil lying, and you start the word of your testimony right there in that tractor, nothing but the steering wheel. You start speaking it. God, what? that's what David did all through the Psalms. There's the word of your testimony. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. Why is that first? Because that's what washes you and takes the conscience away, takes the, the guilt away from your sin. You got lots of things you regret, lots of things I feel so awful about. 
How could I have done that? Oh, and that's the, that's the devil accusing you, telling you how worthless you are. But the blood, we could go into Hebrews, and it talks about how the blood, the blood sacrifices, they would kill the animal and sprinkle the blood, and the person that saw it had put their hands on that animal, and they believed they transferred their sin into the animal. They'd cut the throat of a precious little faultless lamb and take his blood and sprinkle it on the altar. And he would reckon in his mind, okay, that my sin is forgiven because he shed his blood. I, I can believe that. I can believe that. But it didn't take away. It didn't clean their conscience. According to the law, it took their sin away from them. But as it says in Hebrews, the blood of bulls and goats could never take away the conscience of sins. It says if it could, this chapter 10, if you want to write it down, go back and read it. But it says in Hebrews chapter 10, it says if that could have done it, they would have just sacrificed one animal and been done with it. And from then on, they could go on without conscience. But that's what Jesus did. The one lamb of God, faultless, sinless. The blood of the lamb, that washes your sin away. When the devil comes to you and he starts telling you what all you've done and reminding you how worthless you are, you can never be like him. You can never be like her. She's a preacher. She's a pastor. He's a pastor. He's, you're not called to be like that. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Just as much as Peter or John, you were called into this family with the same token. That blood washes away your sin. So when you realize that and you're sitting in the tractor and you're dealing with these things coming against you, you remember, huh? -uh. When Jesus shed his blood, I put my faith in that. That sin is gone. That's not me. That man that did those things, that man that felt those things, that man that was wrong, he's dead. That's done. And the best thing you can do testify. Speak it out loud while you're sitting there. The blood of the lamb wash you and the word of your testimony, what's it do? It overcame the accuser. Now, it's speaking in past tense because this is in the, this is in the tribulation. This is, this is to come. So it's speaking in past tense because that's what we do right now. Gain those victories. Get those victories. And the more you do that, you start to realize when you go to bed at night, I didn't just survive. I overcame the enemy. He came at me brutally, lying to me, telling me I'm worthless, telling me I'm ashamed. I'm ashamed to my family, and I'm ashamed to my name. And I told him, the word of God says Jesus' blood cleansed me, and I stand in that. I'm walking in that. I am clean. I'm clean. I'm born again. I'm a child of Almighty God. And when you speak that way, the last thing you're going to do is intentionally talk bad about somebody or lie to somebody or think an unclean thought about somebody. Your mind is in a spirit state, and you don't want to sin. And you get busy, and you're going about your life, and you're doing what you're doing, and you, you, you've won that victory, and then you get your mind, you're busy, you're doing your work, you're, you're doing the natural things that you need to take care of. And next thing you know, somebody calls you. And you're not thinking on the things of the Spirit. We can't 24 hours a day. We want to. You don't get at least where you get 23 hours a day. That's all you think about. That's what Paul was saying. I pressed toward the mark. But your mind is, you're, you're, you're multitasking. You're doing something. Somebody called you on the phone. You've been walking with the Lord. You've been walking in victory. And you start talking. And next thing you know, this is a good friend. They say, did you hear about so-and-so? And the devil creaks that door open. And you slip and say something. And you get off the phone, you had a good conversation a couple minutes later. Oh, that's good. That's, I'm telling you, that's a good thing when you feel that. When you recognize, I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have said that. Praise God. Because in, the, in your old ways, in your old life, you'd never think twice about it. Unless, through the devil's way, you think, I hope that doesn't get back to who I see said that about. That's about the only thing that'll make us repentant in that way. But when the Spirit of God comes down on you and you got, you, here's how it'll happen a lot of times. You'll get ready to say a prayer or get back in the Spirit and you'll, you'll, and it's like, where'd you go? Where'd you go? And then you'll hear yourself saying what you said on the phone that you shouldn't have said. And here's the beauty. Write this. 1 John 1, 9. Got to memorize that one. All of them you can't memorize, but this is the one you want to memorize. 1 John 1, 9. And the Apostle John said, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. 
<laughs> That's good. That's a good one you want to have in your heart. Because when you, now what's confessing? There's something else that we've got to understand. I'm not picking on Catholics, but, but a lot of times in Catholicism, they just believe that confession is just tell the priest that you did it and you're sorry and say a couple of Hail Marys or Our Fathers or whatever. And you're, that's not what, what the Bible says. Confession. When you confess something, you're acknowledging to the one who knows. You're agreeing with him and acknowledging what I did was wrong. What I did was wrong, and it's not a real confession in Christianity unless you're sorry. What I did was wrong, and Lord, I slipped, and I slipped in that, and I fell. And I'm so sorry, and I don't ever want to do it again. Now, let me show you a difference. If your little child came to you, and, and you'd given them some rules and some things to do, and they came to you on their own accord and said, Mama, I know you told me not to do such and such, and you're thinking, yeah, that's right. And I know that you said that you'd spank me or whatever if I did this. And yeah, that's right. And then they said, I wanted to do what you said, and I wasn't thinking. And I, I, I did that, and I didn't mean it, and I'm so sorry. You're not going to want to backhand that child. You're not even going to want to spank them. You're going to want to take them in your arms and love them and say, it's all right, honey. I know you didn't want to do it. If you know they're telling you the truth, that's confession. And when you do that, you'll find those sins They'll just get so far away. And then when that same person calls you back and they want to talk, you'll have a guard on that mouth. You say, well, I'm not going to do that again. God will keep you from sin. It's walking in the Spirit. We were going over to Hebrews. These are truths that we need to know as Christians. We've been told so long, Paul one of the things that we'll talk about here, and we'll go over to 1 Corinthians in a couple of minutes, but, or in Romans, and he talks about the fact that none of your works, and this is true, and this will tie in with the Hebrews, but you want to understand this. Works will not get you to heaven. You can do everything right, and it's not going to get you into heaven. We've, we've established that. We know that. The law will not get you into heaven. But preachers are stopping short by saying that, and that's where we've been... We've, so many of us, I think, by a lot of well-meaning folks have been deceived, but that's only half of the gospel. Go on and read James and see what he says. Faith without works is dead. You got no faith. We've got so many preachers standing up and saying, it's not whether you, you, you can come to church, you can teach Sunday school, you can do all of these things, you can go out and feed the hungry and clothe the naked and, and, and love the prisoner. You can do all these things, and that's not going to get you saved. You're only saved by faith in Jesus Christ. And I say, amen. And then I'm like, now what? Tell me the rest. And that's all you hear. But James told us that's good. That's good. You only get saved by faith. And when you get saved absolutely only by faith, then you start to produce fruit. If you do what we're talking about now and you understand the same faith, and this is what's missed, the same faith that you used when you looked at Christ on the cross and you said, I need you. I need you to wash me. I need you to forgive my sin like I've told you will do. I need what you're offering me. I accept it. I fully accept it. And the same faith that when you say, I believe that you've received me. I believe this is true. When we prayed this morning, I didn't see fireworks. I didn't see lightning or anything. You may have some people know something happened in them right now. I didn't. But by faith, I believed it because the Word of God said it. And I believed it. And I continued to believe it the next day. And I continued to believe it the next day. And I kept reading. And I kept listening to the Word of God come in until eventually I suddenly realized I'm not the same. The things I used to want to do, I don't have the same draw to that anymore. And you slowly start to realize you're growing. That same faith that got you saved is the faith I'm telling you about tonight. If you've been a Christian for 50 years, you still need that faith just as desperately as you needed it when you got saved because you need it to walk in victory. We're supposed to be walking like these apostles, like the people in the New Testament. There are enough quote-unquote Christians in this country that if we all were walking by the faith that saved us, 
If we were walking day by day, if we were in the Spirit, so let us walk in the Spirit, as Paul, as Paul told the Galatians in 525, if we were doing that, all these Christians that are in the United States, this would be an absolutely moral country with a whole lot of order and a lot of honor and morality. It's like I've said before, it may not be so much so now, but 10 years ago, if you went to Salt Lake City, you would have absolutely no doubt that you're in a very dominant Mormon town because there's morality and there's a certain way to live. You might have four or five wives, but they all got a certain way they're going to live. And, 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 and they, keep, they keep their morale. They keep their morals. And, and they, do you know what I'm saying? They're, they're sticking with what they believe, and it's made a difference in their city. If we were walking by the Spirit, if we as Christians were living with our same faith that got us saved every day in our existence, I'm telling you, there's victory that comes. And I'm not saying, like Paul, I ain't near perfection. But what I'm telling you is after about seven, eight years of me and Sally focusing on this every day, it's why God's put us right where we are right now telling you this. This is how we're walking. And when things come against us, when trials come and tribulations come, we still get knocked back sometimes, but it's like we always know, go, go right back in and get into your faith. Grab that faith. Hold on to that faith. God said, hey, here's one you got to have that, that I used this morning, Romans 8, 37. You've got to always remember that. When you look in the mirror in the mornings, Romans 8, 37, nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through Christ who loved us. More than conquerors. What in the world? And what are all these things he had just said? Uh, been killed by the sword, uh, killed by pestilence, famine, everything you can imagine, every horrible thing that could happen. He says, nay, in all of these things, we are more than conquerors through Christ who loved us. And I heard once a preacher says, how can you be more than a conqueror? And he used the example of... Uh, what was that, Alexander, uh, Alexander Holyfield, when he boxed. That last time that he boxed was, uh, was it when he boxed Tyson or who was it? Battled and battled and battled. and I mean, he went for it when he was gonna, took this fight on, and I don't like telling stories in my messages, but this is worth telling. When he signed this deal that he was going to fight with Tyson, he, he goes into training. And you're talking about like eight months of absolutely grueling, training. I mean, stuff that would kill us and only eating the exact scientific foods and the right things that he would. And he's focus, 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 focus for eight months. Then he goes into the ring, gets his ear bit off, fighting with everything he's got. The match is over. They hold up his hand. He's won. He's sweating. He's bleeding. His head's throbbing. He's breathing hard. And they hold his hand up and he's a conqueror. And then this little bitty 110-pound wife of his comes up into the ring with him and takes the $10 million check out of his hand and holds it up. More than a conqueror. She has all the reward, and she's still just pretty as a picture. Not a hair out of place. That's us. Jesus has already done all the heavy lifting. All the work has already been done. We are more than conquerors. The devil can come against you, but you've got to remember, all he can come after is your flesh. Well, Terry, what else is there? There's everything else. We worry too much about this thing. I hate to tell you this, but it's going to die. Some of us sooner than others, but it's going to die. The spirit world, we now are given authority in it, and when the devil's coming hard against your flesh... You go hard against the darkness because you're taking down eternal things. 2 Corinthians 10.4. We will get to this, Hebrews. 2 Corinthians 10.4. I love this one. It says, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. The devil can cause you to have a toothache. The devil can cause you to get your leg broken. He can cause you to get your back broken. If God allows some of these things for you to go through it, whatever, he might tear your flesh all to pieces. But you can literally pull down the strongholds 
if we just learn to walk in the Spirit. Casting down imaginations and every lofty, smart alecky thing raised up against the knowledge of Christ, we have the authority to pull down. He doesn't worry about it. He doesn't worry about it because he's already learned if I can give him a headache, he's not going to give me any trouble. If I give him a headache, he'll stay home and he'll kick his feet up and he'll, he'll take it easy for a while. But it's the ones that say, my heart is broken for these lost people over here. My heart is broken for these people. I want this to stop. This family is under a bondage from Satan himself, and I'm not going to rest. The Lord has put this on my heart. I'll, Lord, I will die for them. Show me what I can do. This grandchild, this sister of mine, this brother, this cousin, whatever it is, Lord, show me. I'll do whatever you want me to do. I'll pray and I'll pray. Lord, put it on my heart. I'll fast for them. You're tearing down strongholds. And the devil come after you, and that's when, listen, you got to learn how to fight. And you start praying for somebody, and next thing you know, you get violently ill. So you double down and you pray harder. And you start worshiping. That's what we fail to do. I was telling somebody a couple of days ago, I'm trying to remember who it was. This was something, and I won't tell you who, who I heard this truth from because I don't even care for this guy anymore, his teaching. But th th you get good stuff. You get what you want to hear out of people. You've got to understand that. But what he's saying is, when you start, when you get to the point that I just don't, I don't feel like praying right now. I don't feel like fighting in the Spirit. That's when you've got to buckle down and say, that's when I need it most. I'm going to double up. I've said many times about the sacrifice of praise. It's easy, when everything's going all right, to praise the Lord and to sing when we all get to heaven, when everything's going right, that's easy. But boy, when, when you just lost a family member that's the world to you, and you don't have the money to go be with the family, to still get on your knees and say, I worship you, Lord. You are in control. And I'll never take my eyes off you. My heart's breaking right now, but you said you're near to those with a broken heart, those with a crushed spirit. And you start rehearsing the word of God. I'm telling you, it's like doing back to the devil what he's been doing to us all our lives. That's what we're made for. That's what you were born into this family for. Those who've been beat up the worst, they're the ones that can absolutely rip down the strongholds because you know what it's about. Sally and I, last night after we did our scripture read, we really urged everybody to go on and watch The Chosen again. And so when it was over, we started to watch it again. If you haven't seen it, go watch it. Go watch it. It's the best TV you can watch just about. But the first episode was about Mary Magdalene. Oh, my goodness. This woman was, she was in the Red District. Uh, she was a, a hooker. She was a prostitute and filled with demons. She had probably seen things that some of the worst people you know can't imagine. Jesus reached down and touched her. Oh, you talk about the devil freaking out. Because it's somebody like that that is an absolute terror to the kingdom of darkness. I get so excited because when you read in Romans, he says, uh, not many of you were wise, not many of you were wealthy, not many of you were powerful, the, the, the up-and-comers and the beautiful people that God called, he called us, and, and look at us. Look at each one. God chose us because we've had some living. We've had some hurts. We've had some hard things going in our life, and he was there for us. Not just so we can sit back and say, wow, sure glad he saved me. I'm not going to hell. But because we know what it's like for the people that are out there hurting, whose families have fallen apart right there in their hands, who, who, who had no control. We've been there, and we know what it feels like. And he saved us. He saved us so we can start walking in the Spirit and rescuing the perishing and caring for the dying. That's who you are. That's who you are. If you're listening to this tonight, that's who you are. You've been called into this mighty army. Go back and listen to this morning's message. God's called us. And it doesn't. it's not going to be easy here on this earth. This is a broken world. You're going to have a smoother life in this life. By all, by all chances, you're going to have a smoother life if you say no to Jesus Christ because then you're riding with the flow and the flow ends up right off into the pit of hell that's just how this works we're falling 
But when you turn around and start going against it, this old ship going to get beat up pretty bad. <laughs> but what's inside it? The cargo is never going to get hurt. And that's what we want to deliver. Amen, amen, amen. And it's all faith. Just before we go over to Hebrews, Romans 1, we've told this so many times, verse 17, sorry, 16. Romans 1, 16, you've heard this many times. He's not talking about people making fun of him. And he's not talking about somebody thinking less of him because he's a church goer. He says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. He says that because he was standing up and saying, I'm not ashamed. I used to be a Hebrew of Hebrews. I was one of the most powerful Jews on the planet. I went with papers and I arrested Christians and I brought them into court because I could live by the law of Moses to the letter. But now I believe that Jesus died on the cross and that saved me. And I'm completely saved not by all of those laws, not by what all I could do so well. That was rubbish, as we read this morning. But I'm saved because I simply believe that Jesus bought me out of my sin. And he said, you know what? I'm not ashamed to tell people that. I'm not ashamed to tell them, for it is the power of God. It's the power of God unto salvation. What's that? It's God's power to rip you out of all the claws that are trying to destroy you and set you right down on a solid rock. That's the power of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm not ashamed of it either. Boy, it turned me around, changed my whole life, and I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the salvation of God to everyone that simply believeth, that's all, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And verse 17 is the one you've got to hang on. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. Faith, 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 faith. Nothing but faith. If you believe it, it's absolutely true. If you don't believe it, you might as well hang your hat up and forget it. That's crazy. It's absolutely nuts to our way of thinking. If you don't believe that it's true, it's not. But if you do believe that it's true and you hang your hat on it, and, the, and you keep your faith there, and you keep walking in it, that's when something happens. It starts to grow. As I said, we've got almost eight years of just walking by faith and walking by faith. It wasn't even a year before suddenly this faith was real. You can't make the carnal mind understand that because when I tell you that walking by faith is more real than walking in the flesh, that's ludicrous to the carnal mind. You're just escaping. That's just your crutch. Yep. In a world of crippled people, that's my crutch. And that faith, I'm telling you, this is just the truth. I challenge anybody listening, anybody listening, if you'll walk by faith and trust, if you'll just hear what I'm saying and pleading with you over, and you'll walk by faith for two or three days, you'll notice something's different. And if you'll do as we said we would do in the beginning and make your resolve, I give my life to you. No more of this. Uh, rededicate. Like Sister Pat, she knew the truth was in her from a time she was a little girl and something in the book of Revelation just grabbed hold of her and said, come on back. And she did. And it's like the whole gulf of all those years just closes up and you're right. That's the funny thing about faith. You're right back where you started, right back where you quit walking. You don't pay for all those years. He puts you right back in there. And you start walking by faith, and that faith gets real. It's real. And now, after eight years, it's far more real. I'll tell you what, the, th the natural thing that happens, and this sounds funny, and some people, I don't care if people believe me or not. It doesn't matter to me at all. I don't fear dying at all anymore. That doesn't, I think more about where I'm going than I do about where I'm at. Where I'm at, I wait on instructions, and I wait on directions. What do you have me do, Lord? What do you want me to do next? Sometimes we'll talk about we're doing prayer meeting in the morning every day. We do Bible reading on the Internet every night. We go here and we go there and we preach. And we think, well, sometimes we're going to have to take a break. And we say, no, I ain't going to take no break. I'll take a break when I lay this thing down. That's what it's made for. I want to use it as long as I can. And that's not what God necessarily called any of you to do. But he's got something. He's got something far more rewarding for you than what you've ever known here in this world. And it's just on the other side of believing. 
also believe. And to Karen. And to Pat. And to Marina. And to George. And to everybody that's wanting to move forward in this. I promise you, if you'll just believe what the Word of God says, put everything else out of your mind and believe what the Word of God says and hang your whole life on it, it won't take two or three days before you start to realize what I say all the time to you guys. You're not like them. You're different now. You've been born again. All of the things that somebody said, well, I know him. I know about him. No, you know who I used to be. People will tell me a lot of times, oh, at least listen to you on the radio. Well, I appreciate that. I, you don't seem to be too much the worse off, but that's, that old man's dead. Well, I didn't think there was anything wrong with that. I'm not saying there's anything wrong. I'm just saying what you knew then, that's just not me anymore. That's not me. There's a new man. 2 Corinthians 5.17. Oh, that's one to memorize there. 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, therefore, if any woman be in Christ, he's a new creation. All things are new. Behold, behold, all things, old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That's us. That's us. There's one you got to memorize and read it. I want you to read that every day because you are a new, you got to hear, you are a new creation. You're not the same thing that walked in here this morning. You walked out a new creation because you put your faith in what a man did 2,000 years ago on a cross and his body was torn. And you said, I believe it. I believe it. I believe it. And all of the old things are gone. And the more you believe that and the more you speak it, it won't take you two weeks if you'll stay in this. Keep talking to me and keep talking to George. Keep sticking out with other believers. And believing the old is gone, the new has come, you'll start saying, I am new. I'm new. God has changed me. And that is a rewarding, fresh feeling to be 62 years old and feel like I'm as innocent as a nine-year-old boy. That's not that funny. It's awesome, though. It's awesome. Only God can do that. There's not a psychiatrist in the world that can bring that into you. They have to hypnotize you and put you on drugs. But God made you. He breathed life into you. And I've, seen, I've seen 75, 80-year-old men Come to that knowledge. Weldon Jones, whew, just got chill bumps. Little old man never knew knowing Jesus Christ until about a year before he died, and he got it. He got it. I'd sit and read the Bible to him, and he'd lay there in the bed with all that oxygen on, had COPD real bad, couldn't hardly breathe. I'd read certain parts of the Bible, and he'd just go, wow. <laughs> he, just he just couldn't get enough. And that was one of them, Romans, 1, um, Romans 117. Does anybody have a new living translation with them? That's what I was reading to him in the hospital or in the nursing home. And when it says that about, um, it's okay, I'll just tell you what it says. In 17, where we're reading, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. The New Living says, and this, I was reading this to Weldon, and I said, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed. It's from start to finish by faith. And I heard it the first time sitting there reading to him in the nursing home right over here. And I stopped, and I'm taking that in. Get this. And he's laying there in the bed. And I just read that from start to finish by faith. And I looked over at him, and he was staring right at me. When I looked at him, he went, Whew. And I thought, wow. He heard it. What was he, 80? Something like that. This is the word of God. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. So don't think there's no hope for you. It doesn't matter if you think you're too old. It doesn't matter if you think you're too bad. It, all of that's the devil. He's the accuser of the brethren. But faith, oh, there's nothing more powerful than faith. Hebrews eleven six. without faith, it's impossible to please God. Hebrews eleven six. without faith, it's impossible to please God. But those who come to him must first believe he is and that he's the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You just seek him with all your heart and he will reward you. I'm telling you what, Matthew 6, 33, um, how does that go? Matthew 6, 33, uh, blessed are those that hunger and thirst after righteousness. They shall be filled. They shall be filled. Okay, now promising that we're going to go back to Hebrews because we're almost out of time. 
Hebrews 10. This is such a precious passage. And then we'll sit down and have our communion real quick. Hebrews 10, 1 says, For the law, having a sh the law itself, the deeds and doing and doing all the things you're supposed to do, it had a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of those things. Can never with those sacrifices, which they offered year by year continually, could never make the comers there too perfect. So all those daily sacrifices, doing all your penance and, and sacrificing your animals, for if they did, for then would they not have ceased to be offered? Because that the worshippers once purged should have no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices, there's a remembrance again made, every, made of their sins every year. For it's not possible, verse 4, it's not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Wherefore then he cometh, Jesus himself, into the world, and he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldst not, but a body thou hast prepared for me. The Father prepared that body through Mother Mary and through Joseph, well, Joseph being there to raise him. The Father prepared that body for Jesus to indwell. He prepared it for him. In verse 6, And burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast no pleasure. Then said I, Jesus, Lo, I come in the volume of the book it's written of me to do thy will. Now above when he said sacrifice and offerings, burnt offerings and offerings for sin thou wouldst not, neither hadst pleasure therein which are offered by the law. Then he said, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He took away the first that he may establish the second. The old deal of making penance and doing all these things and trying to get right with your sins and work all this. He took that away so he'd make room for the, for the second. Verse 10, by the which we will, we, by which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. This is the word of Almighty God to you right now. Jesus' body was offered on the cross. This is the gospel. This is what saved every one of us. This is the power that converts anybody that gets saved. What I'm reading right now. Through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all, every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oft times the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. How many times have you said, Oh, Lord, I'm sorry I did this again. Forgive me, Lord. I'll do better. Oh, Lord, here I am again. I'm sorry. Forgive me. The same sin over and over and over, and you just got a chain around your ankle, and every time you do it, you pull loose, and you go back, and you do it again, and you do it again. Forgive me again, Lord. Forgive me again. That's over. That's over for you. That's over for you, and it's over for me. You never have to do that again because he raised from the dead. His body took all that sin. You are free. That sacrifice, nothing I'm saying, no, no, no workbooks, no formulas. The gospel of Jesus Christ, believe it. Believe, George, you are free. The roots of bitterness are gone. They're destroyed. But I still feel it. Doesn't matter. You don't live by those feelings. You declare it's gone. You declare it's gone, and you declare I am a new creation in Jesus Christ. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things. And you just keep declaring it. Anger issues, worry issues, put them in the same place. We don't live by that anymore. You're living by the Spirit, and you've been bought. The gospel of Jesus Christ, his body was torn, and he shed his blood for us. Verse 12, here it is. But this man, after he offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. That's where we come in. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father, waiting for his enemies, those that mocked him, the spirits of darkness, the powers, the rulers and principalities of darkness and evil and wickedness. They're, they're having their way on this world. They're taking people left and right. They're taking our very families while Jesus is waiting for them to be put under his feet. That's our job. We walk by faith. Jesus told us plainly, I give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you loose will be loosed. Whatever you bind will be bound. And the gates of hell will not come against you. It's time for us to rise up. When we rise up and we start to do that, then, then here's how it works, and I've used this before. You got the little guy, never had a girlfriend, ugly, skinny. I won't use any examples. Never had him a girlfriend, countryfied, 17, 18 years old. And this little gal moves in down the road. And she's just about as homely, but she's just as cute as she can be to him. And he falls in love with her and he marries her. 
and they get married, and they're just as happy as they can be. They go to the barn dance. Everybody comes together, and here comes a town hottie. And he used to think she was so fine, but now he's in love. And she's at her best. She's decked out. She looks like she's ready to run the streets. And his little girl, his little sweetheart wife goes over to get him something to drink. And she walks up to him, whispers in his ear, I'm yours. Anything you want, come with me. And he looks over and he sees his little wife over there. And he looks at this woman and he says, get out. That's putting her beneath his feet. So when the devil comes to you and you've been clean and you've been doing the right thing and you've been walking by faith and here comes that opportunity, you'll never get caught. You will love this. You can do this. It's not technically a sin. It's not in the Bible. And you can do this and I'll give you all you want. And you look at it and it appeals to you and you say, take a hike. Bless your holy name, Lord, you saved me. When you do that, you have scorned him in the name of Jesus. You've turned him down, and you've put him underneath Christ's feet. And we do that collectively as the body of Christ. When the whole church gets to where we start to walk like that, the Father will look over at Jesus and say, go get your bride. He's sitting there until the enemy is made under his footstool. From hence expecting till his enemies be made his footstool for by one offering, he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Amen. That's you. That's you and me. We are the family of God. You can't do, you got to hear this, and this is what I'll close on. You can't do anything. You could decide right now, I'm going to go with Terry and Sally and get on that jail ministry. I'm going to be there, and I'm going to go start working on the church. And I'm praise God, I'm going I'm to read my Bible every day. I'm going to read it for two hours every day. I'm going to do this and do this. That's not going to get you any closer to God. Not at all. But by the same token, and just as real, if you hear what I'm saying and you determine in your heart, I believe. I'm going to believe. I believe everything he said. I want to hear the word of God. I'm going to turn this off and turn this off, not because that's the good thing to do, but because I want more time to hear the truth. And you start taking in the truth, you will naturally start doing the things that Christians are supposed to do. You don't have to be told what to do in the church. You get your heart full of faith and full of Jesus, and you'll be saying, I'm going to do this. Oh, Lord, I want to bless you by doing this. I'm going to, I'm going to do this. I want to do this. I want to say, and God will move you in the right direction. Faith without works is dead. But you can never get saved by works. Works are fruit. They just naturally are a byproduct of walking by faith. So we're going to walk by faith. We're going to believe it in our hearts that I'm righteous, I'm holy, and I'm pure. Only the part of me that was born of God, because this container I'm living in, hates that part of me. Galatians chapter 5 again. And the part of me that God saved hates the flesh. Oh, gosh, we could go on and on. Romans 8, 8. The flesh is enmity against God. It hates God. But God's put a new spirit in us. So walk according to the spirit. Anybody have a question or thought you want to share? Oh, I'm looking forward to getting into Genesis next week, but I had to share that. The new, the new believer that we've got, the ones that have rededicated their hearts, those of you online that I know are seeking God, uh, Pam and Charlie. Boy, I'll tell you what, that's our friends in Hobbs. You'll see them on uh, uh, old Pam and uh, Charlie and I were buddies 42 years ago in Hobbs, New Mexico. We were bartenders together, and today we're seeking God with our whole heart. We just hooked our friendships back up and he's got his wife and I got my wife and they met the other day we got to meet in Lubbock they're taking up the cross there's, there's several of us that are moving forward all of us going to do that put your faith first believe what the word of God says don't believe the stuff you see what you see is temporary what you can't see is eternal so let's hold our faith let's stand we'll say good night to those online after prayer we'll sing victory in Jesus I guess for the onliners and then uh, we'll take communion and be dismissed.